this next song is called. Sorry. Before we get started with questions for John, um, I'd like to ask the producers in the audience to stand so we can thank them for making this wonderful film happen. There they are. Rebecca and Part of this film, of course, is that these two boys are living in such close quarters and are both hiding the same secret. Um, and their teacher is also struggling with his identity as well. Um, and he almost serves as a cautionary tale for the younger boys in a way. Um, can you talk about that sense of shame around the gay identity that you touch on in the film and how you've seen that personally evolve over time in Ireland? Sure. Well, the the story of the teacher is what renders the film in a modern way, I feel, because um, I think these days kids have, or young people have, a lot to teach adults in terms of empathy and acceptance. Um, you know, I, I, just over a year ago, Ireland was the first country in the world to pass marriage equality by a vote of the people, as you know. Um, that vote was carried due to the uh, attention and um, empathy of young people who spoke to their parents. And uncles and aunts and, and made sure that they did the right thing and you know I think that's what makes the story modern uh, and as for the kids you know I think um, I'm not entirely sure whether they are hiding the same secret um, and I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's particularly important to identify it either I think the most important thing is that it's a story of a lonely boy who wants a friend and that supersedes any um, other concerns you know and, and for me that's the you know the fullest expression of a gay friendship, or if you want to call it that, is friendship, you know, and, and it's so important to see that in, in that way. So I'm, I'm kind of happy to, uh, I'm happy to get a response like this based on a story like that. So. Thank you. Now, um, this is only your second screening of the film, is that right? Yeah. So um, I don't know how much audience feedback you've gotten so far, but um, has there been any... Um... I don't permit it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been really positive. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, we don't see the, the, the characters don't kiss in the film, um, and that might be a source of contention for some people because they might be like waiting for that big kiss at the end. Can you talk us through your decision not to go there? Yeah, well, I just think the last shot with the teacher standing over the two boys and them hugging, I just think if the boys then make out, it's a bit creepy. Um, so, you know, as if he's like, yes, I got, I got, I got what I wanted. Um, no, I, I, like I said, I just think the fullest expression of friendship is friendship. And, and it's so important that, um, you know, I think obviously homosexuality is, is an identity. And it's, um, and it's an identity that I'm so proud to claim. And, you know, I feel it's a privileged identity and uh, I love it. Um, but I think it has to be respected as such, you know. I don't think it's just about hooking up with guys with these strong lips. <laughs> Although, you know, that's an element of it, obviously. <laughs> as I say in Ireland, the element isn't the whole kettle. <laughs> now tell us, um, what, what if any LGBT films have personally impacted you? A weekend. I, that blew me away when I saw it. Uh, and I've seen it five or six times. Uh, I just thought that was incredibly truthful, emotional and real, and kind of rooted in a very mundane, contemporary existence that we all recognise regardless of our gender or sexual orientation or nationality. It was What I loved about that film was how humdrum existence was and how these two men kind of marooned in this flat, 18 floors above the ground, just managed to connect with each other. I just thought it was really Oh, amazing film. Yeah. Absolutely, it's beautiful. Anyone who hasn't seen it yet, it's on Netflix. I don't, like, I don't like any other films. I just like <laughs> that. Mm. <laughs> and, and Weekend, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just feel like that would be number one in the Weekend. <laughs> Andrew Hay would approve. Um, now, the running thread through your work in film and TV, of course, is comedy. And I think it's we will all agree here um, that you have that rare ability to use humour to charm the audience and to, and to highlight your character's common humanity. Um, so talk to us about um, using comedy to tackle meaningful issues. It's so important. I think it's the, it's the closest, um, like in terms of reality, or if you buy into this idea that art is a, is a way of trying to convey an essential truth about ourselves and our brief existence on this 
Manos. I think then comedy is the form that you have to use, or it's the form that I recognize most as, as, as being true to how I experience the world. Um, I mistrust straight drama, um, and I mistrust the idea that that has more value or that it said, has more to say about the real world. Um, I find life to be absurd and funny and sad and, you know, very often at the same time. So I love comedy for that reason. Um, I think comedy drama is, is such a superb form because, you know, it's like laughing at a funeral. You know, you feel so alive, ironically, um, in a moment like that. You know, it's something that is, your laughter is, is unbidden. You can't control it, you know, and it just makes you feel so alive. So, yeah, I'm always going to do stuff that is loosely comic in some form. Where on the dial it'll be, I'm not sure, but it'll, there'll always be a few jokes in there, I think. Sounds good to me. I'm sure there's some questions. Do you notice we're retreating from the... <laughs> <laughs> Let's step forward a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Who has a question for John in the audience? There must be some brave souls. Yes, right here. <laughs> How long did it take you to produce this film? Uh, like soup to nuts in terms of writing and everything? Yeah. Um, maybe... Three and a bit years, I think. Uh, this story has always been in my head. Uh, I think uh, the writing of it probably took about a year, but that's not like every day, you know, drafts and put it away and drafts and put it away. The shoot was five weeks long. Um, so the process was reasonably smooth. You know, you hear stories from filmmakers who have to work, you know, a decade or 15 years to get their film made, but this uh, relatively smooth passage. Um, so about three years, yeah. I imagine anyone who read it was one of those. <laughs> no? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't. Then they had no taste. <laughs> ah. Gentlemen, right here. When do we see it on a thousand theaters and get all of our friends to go see it? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, soon, I think probably March or so, um, there's distribution um, chats going on and it looks good. So uh, it'll be very widely released and I think uh, March ish next year. So, yeah, thank you. Yes, we have a question right here. I thought the music was extraordinary. Uh, will there be a soundtrack? I would love there to be a soundtrack. Did we do the, when we did the deal with the artists, did we talk about soundtrack? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, let's go over it. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the idea was that, that the, obviously the music reflects the little box of records that Ned found in, under the, you know, in, in that little room. So it was supposed to reflect the inside of his mind. So I'm really glad you, you appreciated it for that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we have a question right here. Yeah, I think if you split me in two, I would be half Ned and half Connor. Um, it, the kind of struggle of my childhood was with resolving the fact that I was gay with the fact that I was really interested in sport. And I, it, I, you know, I grew up in a world that was obsessed with binary definition in terms of you know all of them, you know, male, female, straight, gay, sporty, nerdy, um, and then you know, wisdom and, and innocence and youth and age, you know, it just seemed like a very rigid world that I grew up in and it took me a really long time to overcome that and to, and to realize that, you know, that, that idea of rejecting those definitions is, is, is the job of a lifetime, you know, um, so that's very much autobiographical. I also was forced to attend cheerleading practice in my school, <laughs> like that's not, not one beat of that is exaggerated. Um, I also had an English teacher who was hugely inspirational and who would talk to us and who wrote in the margins of an essay that I wrote in school never speak in a barred voice because I was attempting some pastiche of some other writer and he called me out on it immediately and I never forgot that but um, I could also see in him that there was some sadness that he was cloaking and, and the inability to live a full life was troubling him and so that there's, a, there's a little hypocrisy there that's very hard to accept when you're a kid from an English teacher particularly you know, because the lesson is about using your voice so <coughs> that was very much autobiographical too. Um, yeah, so much of it, you know. Some of the bad singing. <laughs> Public urination. <laughs> I could go on. TMI, thank you. <laughs> right in the back here, we have a question. The one character that I found surprisingly special was that the principal in the moment I wanted to ask you about was when the rugby coach asked the principal to run a background check, the principal declined. Was it out of empathy? Was it out of indifference or not willing to stir up trouble? And how do you think that reflects upon like everyone else of interacting with these situations? Well, it's a, it's a really interesting scene, and that that question of the background check is um, a, a, an absurd one, you know, and it comes from this ridiculous conflation of homosexuality with paedophilia, which is something that 
permeated society, particularly Irish society, up until very recently. You know, it's a lazy and stupid thing. So that seems really important for me. And I, and I think Mo Dunford, who plays a rugby coach, played it beautifully because he introduced enough comedy for us to feel the absurdity, but at the same time, there's a truth in how that character felt. You know, I guess your question is about how the headmaster responded to it, and I think that's empathy. I think if you have a grain of intelligence, a question like that would not be entertained. You know. And also maybe he's a little lazy, you know. Um, that headmaster is not a hugely inspirational guy, you know. So uh, he kind of likes things just to be, you know, he the way they he are. Is. Oh, he does. Yeah, he's very self-important. He has a very self-important mustache as well, which is, which was a joy to watch growing. Um, but uh, yeah, he's a, he, he's a, he's a, he's not. He shouldn't be the leader of that school. He really wants to be down in the crowd, you know. He's not cut out for it himself. So um, yeah, it's it's he's the wrong person to ask that question. But I hope my answer helps.